Well, first of all, um, let me just start by thanking you for taking the Secretary and me out of turn today. I know you guys have a lot of stuff on the docket. Um, and obviously, if you have questions or follow-up uh, after today, uh, we'll certainly make ourselves available to talk to you about this or, or any other matters associated with the issue. Um, good afternoon to you, Chairman Hines, and to you, Chairman Cusack, and to the members of the committee. I want to thank you for this opportunity to testify today on behalf of S-10, which is an act providing for climate change adaptation infrastructure investments in the Commonwealth. I'm joined today by Energy and Environmental Affairs Secretary Katie Theo Herides and other members of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs and Administration of Finance. We want to thank you for your work and your support on this issue, and we look forward to working with you and the rest of the legislature as we build on the success that we've had collectively in dealing with climate change here in the Commonwealth. We've already seen the consequences that climate change is having on our state and in our country, and we're beginning to understand the mounting cost of these impacts. We're committed to substantially expanding our investment in resilient infrastructure and other adaptation strategies across the Commonwealth. I want to thank the legislature for their support of efforts to address climate change to date, and particularly with the environmental bond bill that was passed last year, the State Hazard Mitigation and Climate Adaptation Plan, and the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness, or MVP, program, which were all part of that bill. These efforts have laid the foundation for a tremendous amount of work that's now going on across the Commonwealth, and it's shown us that the need for this bill and how critical it is that we dedicate additional resources to expand and implement these new approaches. I also want to thank all the cities and towns that are partnering with us to develop our nationally recognized MVP program and for taking bold leadership to identify risks and implement solutions early on. Together, we've built a capacity to identify our climate change vulnerabilities and take action to become more resilient so that we're all better prepared to deal with the effects of climate change. I think some of you know that I was asked last earlier this year to testify in front of Congress on the need for increased action to reduce the causes of climate change through greenhouse gas mitigation, while at the same time supporting local communities as they adapt and prepare for the work ahead. I was able to share the collaborative approach that we've had here in the Commonwealth, working with this legislature and with many other partners at the local level to model practical cost-effective solutions to climate change that other states and countries can and have already adopted. While the state's moving forward with existing resources to prepare for a changing climate, we continue to identify significant vulnerabilities across sectors that require sustained investments to protect our communities from impacts of climate change. And cities and towns across the Commonwealth have identified and shared their priority actions with us to build resilience to climate change impacts with us. For example, the City of Northampton is designing green infrastructure to reduce stormwater flooding at 10 key sites across the city. The Town of Menden has seen significant inland flooding and is creating new low-impact development bylaws to reduce stormwater. Pittsfield is replacing a high-priority culvert that causes regular flooding. And Belchertown is designing a rainwater harvesting system that irrigates athletic fields at the high school and reduces demand on and increases the reliability of the town's public water system. Through the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program, we're proud to support all of these important efforts. There are only few examples out of the 249 communities that have now used this planning process to demonstrate the breadth and scale of the demand and the desire for Massachusetts cities and towns to respond to the wide-ranging climate impacts that they see. In every community that the Lieutenant Governor and I visit, much work remains to be done, and I'm willing to bet that you hear many of the same things in your districts. First, I want to talk today about the work that's underway to adapt and increase resilience to climate change and the partnerships we've built with the cities and towns to understand the challenges that they face and the scale of their needs. From the beginning of our time in office, addressing this has been a key priority for our administration. The Commonwealth has a long history of leading the way on climate action, and this administration is built on that record by working to bolster the regional cap and trade programs for the electric sector, also known as REGI to prioritize our nation-leading energy efficiency programs through MassSAVE and to focus on cost-effective clean energy resources, which the legislature did a lot of work on from hydropower to offshore wind. We're now targeting state and regional policies to reduce emissions from transportation and buildings, which constitute a majority of our state's current and projected emissions going forward. A key aspect of our work is to ensure that here in the Commonwealth, 
We're developing cost-effective emission reduction strategies, new technologies, and common-sense approaches that can be deployed around the country. As we continue to prioritize emission reductions to address the causes of climate change, we must also implement strategies to prepare for the rapidly changing climate. And once again, our role is not only to protect our own communities, but to deliver, develop and deliver solutions and policy approaches that can be shared outside the borders of the Commonwealth. In September of 2016, I issued an executive order to establish an aggressive integrated strategy to further reduce greenhouse gas emissions and for the first time, prepare state and local communities for the climate challenges ahead. That executive order called for the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs to work with the Executive Office of Safety, Public Safety and Security and to use best available climate change science and risk assessments to develop a state hazard mitigation and climate adaption plan, which was released last fall. The order also called for the designation of climate change coordinators in each secretariat, the completion of agency vulnerability assessments for critical assets, and directed financial and technical support to local resilience planning and implementation through that Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness, or MVP, program. As the work got underway through the order, we also filed the environmental bond bill to ensure that we had funds available to pay for the priority climate change, adaptation, and resiliency efforts that came out of the work and to align existing spending with state hazard mitigation and climate adaptation planning. You passed that legislation in 2018 and was signed into law last August. And that bond bill authorized over $2.4 billion in spending for projects ranging from climate change adaptation to land protection and included over $200 million specifically for climate change resiliency efforts. The bill also codified many components of the executive order that were included in that state plan and MVP program. We now have a resilient mass action team in place, an interagency steering committee to guide implementation of our state plan and to further refine our priority actions. And in the first year, the RMAT will be exploring development of statewide climate resilience standards and completing a resilience evaluation for, your, for our annual capital planning process in your review. As we work to secure additional revenue to deal with this challenge, we must also ensure that all our spending decisions are made in a climate smart manner. I now want to ask Secretary Theo Herides, who will speak a bit about the details associated with climate change and the MVP program. Thank you, Governor. Oh, <laughs> Um, so it's very clear to us that here in the Commonwealth we need to incorporate climate change into our decision making, our risk management strategies, our policies, and our budgets um, and budget processes moving forward. And we've really seen in Massachusetts already the growing impacts of a changing climate. These impacts come with a growing cost. Last March, as a result of this extreme weather we saw over the winter, the New England region experienced loss of life and billions of dollars in damages just on the coast from these nor'easters. And each time there's a disaster, our towns and public agencies incur substantial costs. Many of the current federal funding sources directed through FEMA are only available after a disaster occurs um, and don't let us do that proactive planning in advance to address these challenges. Um, in fact, in the past 40 years, we've seen hundreds of millions of dollars in flood insurance loss payments across the Commonwealth. The new investments we need to make need to take into account climate change impacts like sea level rise and inland flooding that may further expose already vulnerable populations and communities to increased risk. It's our responsibility to ensure that our cities and towns have the financial and technical resources they need to prepare their residents, businesses, and infrastructure for these future conditions um, that are different and, and really more extreme than those they were built to handle today. We've heard from communities and we know from our own work there is a dire need to repair our aging infrastructure and ensure its resilience to climate change. Throughout the Commonwealth, um, just to give you a sense of the scale of some of these investments in, in infrastructure, we have over 370 miles of revetments and seawalls along the coast, 3,000 dams located across the Commonwealth, 300 of which are deemed high hazard, um, and we have more than 25,000 culverts. Uh, and small bridges, most of these which were constructed over 70 years ago under um, often without uh, environmental standards that we have today and certainly without consideration of the increasing uh, scope and severity of storms, rising temperatures and other extreme events. These infrastructure challenges, um, such as aging dams, can really threaten public safety and reduce environmental quality and our liability to their owners. 
Um, right now, we project numbers in the range of 15 to 20 million dollars needed just over the next four years to advance the current status of dam re removal projects under our Division of Ecological Restoration and our Dam and Seawall Program. Um, and we see, re receive hundreds of these requests every year for dam removal um, and restoration. At the local level, there are over 1,100 municipally owned coastal structures in 62 coastal communities. Uh, and we estimate here, again, significant need to bring deficient structures back to their operational status. Um, and this is really not to mention the added incremental cost of bringing them not only to their current status, but to take into account um, the additional intense storm surge and, and sea level rise they'll face in the future. Of the culverts I mentioned, and, and these are something that are often forgotten because they are largely underground, um, but more than half of the 25,000 culverts we have today are in need of replacement um, just to get to current standards. And so uh, those are often poorly located, uh, they're deteriorated or undersized, and they really can lead to significant safety challenges in terms of road flooding, road washouts during extreme storms, um, and they also significantly impair fish and wildlife passage and, and can be a real detriment to water quality. Um, we already have funding in place and do a lot of great work on this issue, but clearly the need is, is more significant than we can fund currently. We've worked a lot to tackle these challenges through our MVP program, and um, this program has really offered our administration um, a much better understanding of the challenges that communities are facing, uh, the risks they see, um, and also some of the strengths they can build on to really begin addressing and, and tackling this challenge. And I would say all of your communities have shown such leadership on taking on this issue, on, on wanting to do this work, and on putting out best practices um, to take on this challenge. Uh, in the first three years, the program has enrolled 71% now of cities and towns in the Commonwealth, um, and so we really see that as underscoring the need, but also the enthusiasm to take on this work and to help um, not only prepare for climate change, but to really design the resilient communities of tomorrow uh, that have strong economies, that have safety, and are, are good places to live. This program includes both a, a planning phase and an action grant. Communities are only eligible to apply for real money through the action grant if they've done the planning work. Um, we need to see that the solutions they're designing are, are climate smart and consider the best data. Um, and this year, our action grant, which does put out um, significant money, up to $2 million a project, uh, saw a request for $26 million of funding. Um, and, and we had $10 million of project funding to give out. So that was with only a third of communities eligible to apply. Um, this year, there were 92 additional communities that came into planning, which means that by the end of next year for the action grant, there will be uh, 249 communities who are eligible to apply for that real money. So we, we imagine the need will go up significantly. Um, increasing that need even further, most of the projects we're seeing in this early stage are design and feasibility studies. Um, we expect many of those projects to mature to construction. Um, and so we project that that need will, will just continue to go up. Um, some of the projects we've seen uh, through this program, the governor spoke to a number of them. Um, I'd add a, add a few here. Right now, Braintree, uh, using Executive Office of Energy and Affairs, Environmental Affairs money, is advancing um, through the final design and permitting stage of two obsolete and deteriorating dams that have the potential to create long-term disruptions to transportation infrastructure, including the commuter rail, um, in addition to, to three bridges and nearby, nearby development. Deerfield, who has been a real leader on this issue, um, is working on a green inst infrastructure installation project and replacement of two priority culverts um, to put in larger, properly sized culverts that will add resilience to their town center. Um, and, and I think you will actually hear from the town of Deerfield later on this issue. Mattapoisett has purchased 120 acres of forest, streams, freshwater wetlands, and coastal salt marsh as conservation land um, to really protect some of these vulnerable areas in, in their community. And we are seeing um, a lot of potential in these nature-based strategies that utilize intact natural ecosystems or replace um, natural ecosystems through restoration and other techniques to create this type of resiliency. Uh, the town of Millbury is doing a complete downtown uh, stormwater capacity project throughout Armory Village using green infrastructure techniques like stormwater planters, porous pavers, and pervious pavement. 
um, and they're addressing not only stormwater runoff but also uh, reducing the impact of heat and we're going to be seeing a lot more heat in the future and so um, getting rid of some of the pavement actually can have a positive effect there and then certainly a lot of work is going on in Boston through our program, including um, developing a resilient building code and working on a legacy waterfront park that will have resiliency value through nature-based solutions while also providing access to recreation. We're really, I think, um, very proud of all of the progress so far, but we continue to project that this demand will continue to increase and want to make sure that we have the resources available to give um, this kind of support throughout the Commonwealth. Um, we've heard, I think, through this response, really loudly and clearly that communities want to be engaged. Um, they want to design these climate resilient communities. They're aware of the risks and, and they see all of the challenge. Um, and we've really been able to, to catch a glimpse of that and, and work um, with them in partnership. And, and we'll be using these plans as we continue to de deploy our strategy. So I'll turn it back over to the governor. So <clears throat> to just put this in context, not just here in Massachusetts, but nationally, when the National Governors Association was in Washington in February, we met with uh, the folks at the Federal Emergency Management Agency to talk about this issue. And, uh, and they said a couple pretty interesting things. One was that they had paid out $80 billion in disaster recovery relief funds in the previous two years, which was actually more than they had paid out in the previous 35. And because of that, they were starting to put funds out, small amounts of money, but to put funds out to states and localities to do exactly this kind of vulnerability planning that uh, they are starting to believe is going to be an important way of protecting the federal government against the costs of storm frequency and storm severity. The other thing they talked about was historically FEMA has basically reimbursed communities and states up to the point of sort of replacement of whatever was there before. But they are now concerned that if they only help communities and states fund repairs up to the point that they were at before, then the next time the storm comes through, they're just gonna end up having to pay for it again. And so they're now talking about whether they need to build resiliency and fortification efforts and, uh, and, and sort of smart planning into the way they support communities and states in rebuilding after storms, which says that this is not just an issue here in the Commonwealth, but this is playing out across the country. And that has a lot to do with why we filed this legislation in the first place. Um, I think, as you all know, the bill proposes to increase the state's deeds excise tax from $2.28 to $3.42 for every $500 of the price of a property sale. That allows us to invest approximately $137 million annually or over a billion dollars over 10 years in these climate change adaptation and resiliency projects throughout the Commonwealth. The increase provides a sustainable, dedicated funding revenue stream that will be available to invest directly in local and state climate change work year after year after year without further appropriation. And the funds will be able to be spent across fiscal years, meaning that we'll be able to support larger and more complex construction and implementation efforts while providing the kind of funding certainty that municipalities are looking for. The revenue will be deposited into a Global Warming Solutions Trust Fund created through last year's environmental bond bill, and the funding will be used to support municipalities and regional municipal partnerships through loans, grants, technical assistance, and other mechanisms to implement priority projects that fortify infrastructure, enhance natural resources, and protect public and private property and our municipal tax bases, the exact types of properties that this revenue stream is funded through. Property owners have the most to gain from this legislation, and therefore they also have the most to lose by limited investments in resiliency. And because the revenue stream's recurring, it won't require uh, and won't rely on borrowing. It can be directed based on sound data and policy criteria to assist homeowners, businesses, and other institutions where necessary to plan for climate change. It can also be used to build capacity at the local level to provide the broadest long-term benefits for communities and property owners. The proposal builds on investments and planning efforts of the legislature, our municipal partners, and ideas we've heard traveling around the state. The Lieutenant Governor and I and the Secretary and the rest of our team believe it addresses the serious needs and challenges the Commonwealth will face from climate change and our ability to make a different future possible for our communities. 
The funding that will be available through this legislation would allow us to make important investments in cost-effective data-driven solutions, and it can work in parallel with other developments in climate change mitigation, including programs supported by the state budget, the capital plan, and other resources and proposals that are out there, including the Community Preservation Act, which was first signed into law by my former boss uh, and colleague and mentor, the late Governor Paul Salucci. We look forward to continuing this dialogue. Again, we appreciate your time and your attention. Be happy to answer questions here uh, or later or both. Thank you.